Hello and welcome to another edition of Showband Heroes, where we take you down memory lane to a very special time in Irish life, a time when people went to ballrooms every weekend to, if you like, leave their troubles behind them for several hours and dance the night away, and in some cases meet boyfriends and girlfriends and meet partners for life. It was a special era in Irish life, and tonight we're going to relive those heady days of the showband scene. We're joined by Frankie McDonald, trumpet player with uh, the Joe Dolan Band, sometimes known as the Drifters. Eamon Keane was with the Indians. And Father Brian Darcy will talk to us about his observations of the time. To kick us off, I'm uh, going to start off with uh, Frankie McDonald. Frankie, you're from Clonus in County Monaghan, and uh, you would have played with Joe Dolan's band, the Drifters. They would be regarded as probably one of the most successful show bands of all time. How did you get involved in the show band scene? What was your initial interest in music? Well, our, our house in Clonus was a kind of a musical house. My dad played uh, violin with a band called McMahon's Band, Dance Band. And uh, there were four or five bands. It's only two and a half thousand people. There was Dave Dixon, Des Tracy, Seamus McNeil. I mean, local bands uh, kept the music going. But my our house, musical house, and a lot of the guys were in and out father played the fiddle no tv bit of radio at night but it was all kind of conversation music stuff like that and uh like poor old pat mcgigan god be good to him he was down played the tilt whistle and then he started playing the tenor sax and you know after that then uh i did show an instance i, I joined the brass band a good friend of mine uh, <clears throat> barney mccabe pat mccabe the writer's dad got very fond of me and brought me into the band when i was nine and listened to guys playing trumpets and different instruments I got very involved and I mean I had great tuition with these guys because they were playing with dance bands and a lot of them read most of them read music because that's the way it was so then uh, you know a school grand everything was hunky dory but I was into the music so an ad came in the paper for recruits for the army school of music in Dublin and uh, applied for it and went up for an audition uh, at that time, you didn't really have to play, but the fact that I took out a trumpet and played a few tunes, I got in straight away and spent, uh, I don't want to go on it, but this too long, but that's where I started, three years training. Then I was done with the Western Command Band here in Adlone. That's why I live in Adlone. Uh, and then I uh, did the usual army kind of recitals. I was looking to tour with uh, President Kennedy. I was part of the trumpet section at Arbor Hill. Uh, Aris Nook, I played with the Garden Party Band, uh, played a lot of stuff, I played at four presidents' funerals over the years. Then we got a trip to Cyprus, uh, first West, first band, uh, army band ever to go to Cyprus, 1965, the UN. And out there it was, uh, basically we were non-combatants, so we got involved in various jobs. And uh, we used to go up to the tents at night, play for the boys, and that that went into a whole new thing because fellas from different camps came up and brought us down to the Finnish camp, the Swedish, the British. So for the last few months, months at Cyprus, I was with a show band. <laughs> it was called the Irish Rovers. <laughs> so that's what I did for the last few months. So after that, I came back and I joined the same show band for a couple of years. And then I, I, I met my wife, May, and she was playing keyboard with her dad, Kieran Kelly's band. And uh, then about 1968, I saw, uh, get married in 67, 68, I saw an ad for the Drifters, the Evening Herald, and I'll forget the front page, it said Drifters Split. And I must have looked at 20 times, and I didn't know Ben or Joe. I used to see them, all right. And uh, uh, I rang, got Ben's number, rang him, and uh, he says, where are you playing? I said, this Friday night at McLaughlin Carnival with Kieran Kelly. And he he appeared. Actually, John Delamer, and you'd know John Bryant very well. You'd all know John. So I'm coming down from the usual cup of tea for the band, <laughs> ham sandwiches. And uh, some of the guys had a drink. So what we did was a drummer, Billy Borgan actually was in drums, Jimmy Mullally on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And Herb Albert was in very much at the time. So I used to do a bit of half an hour warm up of my old bat and played Herb up. So Ben arrived in incognito and left. And I got a phone call the next day. He said, the job is yours if you want. So it was quick as that. And I hate it. I rang my wife, she was in England, she was pregnant with Keith. I said, what do you think I should do on this one? She said, whatever you want. <laughs> you were in. So that was as quick as that. And I had three weeks to get out of the army, still rehearsing with the uh, drifters. We started with drifters. 
Uh, well, actually, Ben rang me. He says, "Will you come up to the AR?" And there's a lot of fellas looking for jobs. But he says, hey, "What do you want?" He says, "We're looking for a trombone player." So I was addition a different trombone player. So Seamus Shannon walked in. I didn't know him at the time, but an accordion strapped in his back and a trombone under his arm. And he said, so "It's a trombone we're looking for. I play a bit of that as well." He said. So he says, hey, "Okay." So he took out the trombone and played Bram's lullaby and joined him on trumpet. As sweet as you'd get. And Ben walked in and I says, I just nodded, Ben, this is the guy. So three weeks and then we started playing on the 15th of August, 68, in Las Vegas Ball in the Temple Moor. And uh, I think I forgot the programme. Joe spent most of the night on the floor and Ben and I were pulling them back. So that was the beginning. Well, let me come to the success of the Drifters a little bit later on. But can I just ask you, Frankie, the fact that you played in the army band, were you one of these musicians who could, as they say, read the dots or... Did you learn the trumpet totally by ear? At the beginning, Ken, I did. In Clonus, and I was reading, like, boys were ringing me on, but well, the army trained us. We did classical stuff, overtures, different stuff, and marches. We did the Easter parade for many years. Yeah, you had to read music. That was my in, really, in a lot of stuff, because 71, we went to, we went to South Africa, and uh, I was actually back in five acts, two shows a night, including Joe, because I was a reader. Paper Dolls, Chris Andrews actually was on the show and uh, uh, different people. So uh, I, I read music, you know. Yeah, I'll come to, as I say, the, the, the heady days uh, a little bit later on. But Eamon, I want to turn to you. I mean, was your entry into the show band scene similar to that of Frankie? Uh, not really, no. I started in the De La Salle Boys Band in Valley Firm uh, and I learned in school. So we were taught after after school hours, we had band rehearsals. And as whoever could afford or be able to get an accordion at the time was taken in. But we did, we started off first off on, on the tin whistle, and then it was the harmonica, and then on to accordion. I eventually went on to trumpet myself, and that was my instrument for many a year. And I loved it. Incidentally, Frankie's a fine player. Fantastic pair, Frankie. I remember. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and what really you looked after you looked after Keith and Lorraine, him and Fair Lady for a while. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. thank you very much. And I'll tell you, uh, you you played at Joe Dolan's funeral in the church. You remember that? Uh, um, I, I I did the Ave Maria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A fabulous, absolutely thank wonderful you. sound. But anyway, myself, I learned the trumpet when I was in the accordion band. So it meant I, there was one trumpet player and uh, then we got, had two and then three, but three I think was a total. And we would have had to, I would have had to step out and play a number with all the accordions doing the backing. That went on. We, we had a, a tour with Bridie Gallagher then in the 50s during the school period. And the Solomon family, they... They were the ones that promoted the concert tour. So we played over in, in Liverpool in the Royal Philharmonic Theatre there. Lovely, lovely. We, we also did two weeks in Edgware Road and they changed the name of the theatre because of Riley Gallagher's success. They changed the name of the theatre to the Irish 32. That was in those days. We're going, you know, back in the yeah, 32, 50s, yeah. 50s, late 50s. And then... Uh, we always played, uh, you know, this what we call the stew house. It was a social club uh, in Ballyferm every Sunday night. When you did, uh, you played for an hour and a half, and then there was a break, and the break was uh, a decade of the rosary, and you got a, a bottle of orange, and you got a crisp and biscuit, and that was the the, the, break, the interval. You went back and you played the other hour and a half, finished up. We decided then we'd try doing some of the other parochial halls around Dublin to the extent that we, we started a band and decided, you know, we'd bring in certain instruments, it being guitar. The first introduction of a bass into our band was in 1962 uh, as the casino show band. Brian Woodfull came along with his brother John and he, he was helping out at the time and we decided we needed the bass in the band and he learned the, ba the bass. John teaching him a few of the rudiments of music. But anyway, from then on, 
we, we, we were nine years at the casino before we became the Indians. And the casino was a very good band. We enjoyed it really immensely. And, and very good band. They're a very good band. Music day was great, yeah. yeah I remember well, yeah, it was, yeah. It was, we enjoyed our rehearsals, if you know what I mean. It was, uh, we weren't into money. There was no such thing as money then anyway. You know, there was, you, you got, I think I, I went professional with the casino on 17 pounds a week. And that was good money when you consider the fact that a week's wages then was less than a fiver. Uh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so. Let me ask you, Eamon, um, you know, I, I think in, in probably in Frankie's day, there was big acts like uh, the Beatles and Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley and so on. But uh, you're sort of several years before that. I mean, who was the big name in the charts at the time, if there even was a chart? Who sort of cannot, inspired I, you? I can only reflect back to when I was a young person. And, and really the big thing at the time was Rock Around the Clock. Yeah. Hey, hey, teddy Boy era. You know, it was a Teddy Boy era. And I remember Lugs Rannigan would be up in the Gala Cinema in Valley Farm, but, and Lugs, they'd send in the fellas into Lugs and the Jacks and, and he'd, he'd send them out in a different condition altogether, you know, <laughs> hey, with more manners, you know. But I, I think, I think you, you need to say, I mean, that Lugs was a guard. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, Lugs was a, a famous guard. Uh, yeah, he was, yeah, he was. Yeah. He was right. So, Brian, I'll come to you. I mean, you would be known as a man of the cloth, a man who's brought a bit of religion and, let's say, a touch of God to uh, the Irish showbiz scene. When you were growing up uh, in the North, um, mm -hmm. you know, even though you decided to take a, a career uh, as a priest, who was, if you like, the acts of the time, the singers of the time that you took a liking to and developed your interest in showbiz? Well, I think, uh, like every young fellow going to school uh, at that particular time, uh, I was lucky enough uh, to be sort of stupid. Um, and uh, in the North, if you didn't pass the 11 plus examination, you have got no free education or got poor education. And my father, God be good to him, said that. And he sent me to my aunt in Oma, where the Christian Brothers School were there when I was nine years old, eight years old. And I used to go in the train each uh, Sunday evening on my own uh, and come back on a Friday evening and stay with my aunt then to, to do that. And at the school were people like Pat Chesters and Brian Call and Frankie McBride um, and Leo Dore and Ray Moore, people who became the Plattermen and other sorts of bands. And they were learning music as the two boys were uh, in the school in the school band, St. Eugene's band. And that's where, you know, they, they turned out to be some of the best musicians ever in the country. Uh, Ray on, on trumpet and Pat Chesters on, on saxophone. And they became friends of mine and I followed them and that gave me an interest in the show bands. I was always one that needed to study uh, with Radio Luxembourg in my ear. It was the only place that there was music played at that time. And there was all sorts of great music in that. I mean, nobody can forget that era without the, the you know, the, the, the people like the Bachelors and Lonnie Donick and, and you know, people who are bringing in scaffold, skiffel, but most of all Elvis Presley and Cliff Richard. They were the two big heroes that I had throughout all my life. I, I, I was a I was a Stones man rather than a Beatles man. I was an Elvis man rather than a Chris man, um, rather than a Cliff man. Uh, but I, I all um, all got them all. But you had to be. It was like following a football team. You, you couldn't be both Cliff and Elvis, um, and, and you, you know you, you had to be one or the other. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I went to school and 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 at that stage. But I think. I often think back about this, and I spoke to the late Brandon Boyer, who was always a good friend um, throughout his life about this later. And I think th the moment of the show band thing is, I was a young fellow going to St. Michael's School in Inniskillen, probably about uh, 14 at the time, maybe around that era. And I was walking up in a Inniskillen town, <clears throat> and outside the town hall in Inniskillen was a, a, um, a Mercedes van park with the Royal Show Band written across it. Um, and I just thought this was total, absolute glamour to see aeroplane seats and everything else in a big van like this. And I, I'd, I'd heard of these Royal Show Band, but and, and it was just a myth. Or, you know, they were just a myth to me. And I went home and I asked my father, could myself and my brother go to it? And he actually allowed me to go to it in the town hall in Skillen. And we cycled in the five miles. And that, to me, was the greatest night that I ever saw because I saw a very young Brendan Boyer just yeah. turned 
professional. I saw Tom Dunphy, God be good to him. I saw Charlie Matthews, Eddie Sullivan, the, the, the entire band, Jim Condon. They were an entire band. And I'd never, ever seen anything as exciting, as brilliant as that as they were. I had seen and heard the Melody Aces, I had seen and heard the Clipper Carton, and they were terrific bands and entertaining bands, but the Royal were just in a different category altogether from them. Oh, they know they, and and they, were, they were the people that said to me, show bands are just what it is, and, and that's what they were, a phenomenal band that had a show, but were also great musicians and brought glamour to it. Uh, Brendan Boyer was doing Elvis Presley. Uh, Tom Dunphy was doing all the country acts of the day. Hank Lachlan and all the songs of that, that era. Um, and Charlie Matthews was doing the ballads of Matt Monroe and all of those at that time. Um, and, you know, it, there were four different members of the Royal Showman had number ones at various stages. So that'll give you an idea. They were the first band to record or show band to record and um, 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 come down the mountain, Katie Daly. And the flip side of it uh, was uh, I Heard a Bluebird Sing. Uh, and Brendan Boyer was on neither side. Um, the, the Lonnie Donegan forementioned was the big star. And so they decided they'd have to do a, a skiffle version. And that's what it was. They took an original song by Eamon O'Shea from Galway, made it into a skiffle. And that was what it was. And then they did a, a Leuven Brothers song in the B-side, I Heard the Bluebird Sing. Um, and uh, Brendan didn't appear until the second record on that. So, you know, teaching them had it sorted out, you know, what did we do? But to see uh, to see Brendan Boyer was the same as to see Elvis. You know, that was just what it was. And, uh, you know, he was jumping over Tom Dunphy on the stage. And, and it was it was electric, magical, uh, unbelievable. Um, and to this day, it lingers in my mind. And um, uh, later, the Royal uh, were the band that had the Beatles opening for them in 1962 in, in, uh, in Liverpool. The Beatles were the relief band to the Royal. Um, and um, John Lennon was asked afterwards what he thought of the Royal on that night. And he said, it was wonderful. It was the best talent competition I ever saw. Uh, because he thought that's what it showed on <laughs> a talent competition because there were so many different people doing different acts and yeah. it was it was just a fierce night of entertainment we played relief to the royal show band in port rush we had a week in in the arcadia uh, which is now part of the ballroom itself is now a children's swimming area but uh in, in those days back in the would have been mid 60s and we played relief to the royal show band. they came in on the friday they were the big band visiting so we were the resident band for the week with the visiting band, the Royal Show Band. Absolutely amazing. Very good. Amazing. Uh, Frankie, I want to come back to you. Um, talk us through, if you like, how busy the schedule was. I mean, was it seven nights a week? Well, at the beginning, it was definitely six nights a week. Five five would be the, the bottom line on that one, you know. And uh, I remember the first week we played, I can remember nearly the, the, the programme we did Las Vegas, and then we did uh, the Fiesta and Letter Kenny. We did uh, uh, the commercials on Gannon. And then we did Killer Carnival, which was kind of around that time. So between the carnivals, the dance halls, as Eamon will tell you, and Brian, and you all know it was it was flat out for every band. But yes. so it was, uh, when he, he, you know what I mean? At that time, he was probably in the top 10 or 12 bands anyway. And the Reynolds Halls, Con Hines, so they were all open to them. Like, I mean, every band didn't get in at the drop of a hat. So uh, we were very busy. For the first year was really, really busy. And then uh, kind of... I, what I year get, are we talking about here? Are we talking 63, 60, Well, that's when I came in, 68. Six of us joined the band. Like the the, the, the original drifters, Tommy Swarbrick, Joe Gilhaney, Des Doherty, all those guys, they did their own thing. They left the band. So I thought it was... Uh, well, I thought this is definitely show business, you know what I mean? And uh, like a minute in July, we rehearsed for three weeks and then we started. So the following April, we were down in uh, Kong, Nancy Morphy. You might remember Nancy Morphy, Eamon. I do and indeed, yeah. Great lady. Anyway, we were down playing for her and uh, I was privileged because I used to travel with Ben. The fact it was not long, I had to make the extra trip to meet the boys in various places, Roscommon, uh Mullingar, it was going south, it was Kilbeg, and we had all these places to meet, you know. So uh, down to Nancy Murphy, and we had time to spare. We were down early, and Joe and myself. Seamus used to travel at the time. And Ben says, lads, I want you to hear a tape I got the other day. 
and uh, put in the car. And this guy was strumming the guitar, no back, and take me and break me and make me an island. And it really didn't mean that much. You know, I says, Ben, I want to get an arrangement of this. What do you think of this song? And after about a half an hour, we all forgot about it. So we drove up Ashford's Castle and looked round and wandered back and did the gig, listened to it again. And that was it for about three months, no less, even six weeks. And the arrangement came back from England, a guy called Johnny Arty musician, very talented guy, leading towards brass. And as you all know, the counter melody in Make Me an Island was not as important, but it was part of the show. It became a big part. In fact, near the end of our time, Joe, poor old Joe, before he passed away, he used to sing the brass part and look over at me. And there was no melody. But anyway, that was the beginning, really. And uh, a guy called Jeffrey Everett, Lo- Radio Luxembourg, <clears throat> and uh, he got the power play, started going into the charts. The number one, and it was number one in Ireland after about six or seven weeks, but it went up to number three in England, selling 20,000 a day. Uh, phenomenal at the time. And uh, the Beatles broke up, and uh, Yellow Submarine came sitting number one, <laughs> but it made number three. So that was the beginning of. Uh, the tours and the excitement, if you like, you know. Yeah, but in, but in, in the Irish ballrooms itself, I mean, are we looking at situations where the average ballroom would hold anywhere between, you know, 800 and 1,500 people? I mean, these are phenomenal numbers uh, for the time. Oh, I indeed, I yeah. Don't think, I don't think yeah. you would have got Joe, Joe Dolan in if you were only getting 1,500 people. Well, no, we were doing, like, probably we were doing, like, Roseland Moat now, where I'm not too far from this. The average crowd would be 17, 1800. And yeah. the, the guy at the door, you know, the bouncers at the door say, Oh, Dickie had five, Dickie had 50 more than your last week. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was fierce rivalry, crazy stuff. Yeah. No one knew how many was in. Yeah. <laughs> it looked great, you know. But I think you would remember that the Arcadia, the Arcadia at Bray was probably one of the bigger ballrooms. Three and a half thousand. Yeah, huge place altogether. Like the TV club would be stuffed on a Monday night. We'll do, but yeah. it, was an, it was very exciting. I can remember that first year. It was a spotlight dance, wasn't it, on the Monday? Spotlight. And all the bands that would be off, to be all there, to be in the dressing room. And the students ran the other nights during the week. Yeah. 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 No time dancing on a Tuesday. And the, That's uh, right. Yeah. yeah. But there were, there were, and then the Olympia, uh, you know, I mean, the, the halls were brilliant. And, the, and then Mad Unigans, uh, the night bite on the way home, you know, yeah. the little, yeah. little cafe. On the mm. on the street on beside the on, on the keys, yeah. everybody would meet there at four o'clock in the morning and have runny egg sandwiches or whatever was going. On. And there was great excitement. The gig, the gig spot. What are you blowing now? The trumpet players would be on one end and the sax players. What are you playing now? I'm playing a con. Oh yeah, great. It's that kind of a scene. We were all. We both, had we had a great scene. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I, mean, I think you're underselling yourself, lads. I really do think you're understanding yourself. That is, that's how you were seen in the band business. But, you know, and, and among musicians, that's how it was seen. There's a quite a different scene if you're looking at it from as a punter situation. Don't forget that in the beginning, there were no halls, only parish halls. That's right, yeah. That's right, there were yeah. small halls. And and one of the man who died recently, Peter Smith, he he actually got with the Mighty Evans in the early days of the Mighty Evans and with the Fine Avon Keeley Band, which was their original thing. They actually played in places where there was no electricity. Mm-hmm. Electricity hadn't come to them, and they ran them off batteries and car batteries uh, to, to whatever instruments they had at that stage. So you're talking about the, the show band scene coming through, particularly with the Clipper Cartons in the 50s. Clipper Cartons were nominated as the band uh, were called the Clipper Carton in 1954. So it was they and the Melody Aces and bands like them and Johnny Quiggis who, who, who broke the initial scene until the Royal brought it to a different thing in the late 50s and 59. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was a lovely coincidence of many things. It changed the face of Irish society. First of all, people now could for, have petrol and cars, which they never had before. People had to go to a dance in the 50s on bicycles, and you mm-hmm. only went as far as a bicycle could take you. Now, but with, with, with the end of the 50s, the beginning of the 60s, Sean Lamas had come and had revolutionized Ireland. And not only had he revolutionized Ireland, he had industrialized Ireland, and he had pe- given people some sort of a wage, plus the fact that there was no electricity in every place. And it literally was a light in the darkness. 
that came and brightened the face of Ireland and it changed completely at that stage. And it was also the era um, when uh, the, the World War II had just ended and it took it about 10 to 12 years to uh, have its effect on places. You know, don't forget in the early 50s, people still were having, getting a ration book to get butter and bread and sweets right into the 50s, into the, into the middle 50s as it were. Yeah. Both in yeah, Britain. That's a, that's a very interesting observation, uh, Father Brian, and I might come later on to the arrival of television and, and yes. the opening up of radio and so on. But Eamon, I want to go back to you. Um, am I right in saying that you played in a band, I think they were called the Casinos? We, we were operating from 1962 until 1971 as the Casino, and then from then until now as the Indians. You changed the name, and once you became the Indians, what sort of a difference did that make to the act? We we just changed our program then, and we had to give it a bit of a thought, and we introduced the accordions. Myself and Shay O'Reilly, we were in the boys band, and we took the accordions up and then started playing those two accordions at the same time, you know, which made it sound a good big sound. You didn't have the effects then that you have now. You didn't have your, your, your backing tracks or anything like that. So the band sounded well with the two accordions going. They were able to turn it. Was it. A very, it was a very clever idea, I tell you that. I mean, it brought you into a, a huge league altogether. Yeah, it yeah. Did. Yeah. But the dress, don't forget, the, 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 every, there were so many bands. There were 600 bands in Ireland, over 600 ba professional bands in Ireland. That's uh, right. During the 60s. So you had to do something to be different. And it was changing slightly from pop into a pop country. Sometimes it, it divided into pop bands and country bands. Mm -hmm. And with the Mighty Evans and Tom versus the, and I suppose Joe and the Drifters would have been a pop band. And Dickie and them were doing a pop band. And the Nevada would have been a pop band. So it, 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 it developed and you had to develop, you had to do something. But I mean, the Indians was, I think, was one of the most magical ideas that anyone ever had. Because Very colourful, yeah, yeah. Apart from the music, the visual thing was phenomenal mm. uh, uh, to, to pe people coming in. And, you know, people people had got fed up just looking at fellas playing music or even doing, doing funny songs and all that. So this was something really, really exciting and different. Um, yeah, and the attention. And, you know, it wasn't it was it wasn't just music, which was excellent, but it was also how do you sell a band? It was the show. Show, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Father Brian, I want to come back to you there. Just something you touched on earlier on about, you know, the electrification of Ireland and the opening up of the country. When television arrived at the end of 1961, how important was that in terms of, we'll say, getting on the likes of The Late Late Show? I think there was a TV series called The Show Band Show. What did that do in terms of selling the show band package to the public? Well, it was it was it was absolutely the essential to to bringing it to a different level altogether. But you see, previous to this, you know, no, very few Irish bands. They occasionally did get on 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 English shows. The Cadets did, and the Royal did, and maybe others did. The Capital did. The Capital had their own show in, in television in, in in the early days. On, but it was British television, and therefore it could only go to the east coast of Ireland. The west coast of Ireland didn't get that. So the the, the advent of television, as I said, was it was this progress of changing the face of Ireland. Ireland was becoming a modern world, a modern country, uh, and and in, in every possible way. And and television, its own television station. Now it had only one station. And uh, it, it was difficult enough to get it. Radio was also a big help in selling it. And radio, you know, RTE at that time, or Radio Awareness it was at that time, opened in the morning, closed at 10 o'clock, uh, opened at 1 o'clock for the news, closed at 3 o'clock, and didn't open again till 5 o'clock in the evening, and ended uh, with the Irish sweepstakes programme at a quarter to 11 at night for a quarter of an hour and closed at that stage. That was the extent of, 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 of any sort of communication at all. So, so Radio Luxembourg must have been a bit of a godsend for bands. Oh, yeah, certainly Radio, was. <laughs> Radio Luxembourg was all it was. And of course, don't forget, that's the reason why the pirates come in in the 60s as well, because they realised there was a market for it and nobody was supplying it. And BBC had to copy the pirates and eventually RTE had to copy the pirates. So, you know, music and, 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 and management and selling things, it, it was, it was, it was, 
you so, it's the old thing. It was much easier to seek for forgiveness than permission. I was just saying it was, it was the evolution of, of music with, with radio coming coming yeah. to your opportunity to get in and record. And Eamon Andrews came to Dublin with the TV club. He bought all the, the, the four provinces. Four piece. And, and he had, yeah, the four piece. And he, he, he had a, a recording studio in there. In actual fact, it was only rigged up and, and they got a recording to do. They, they rigged up the actual studio on, on the dance floor. They had sound barriers. They put them up. Sure, and, sure. And they, but they, anyway, just, I just want to come back to something there. When, when your band changed to the name of the Indians, I think a lot of people in bands, you know, they enjoyed the buzz that went playing in the big ballrooms and the money and travelling up and down the country, which I'm sure became um, a bit tiresome after a while, and we might touch on that a little bit later on. But in your case, you were dressed up in sort of, you know, an Indian outfit with paint on your face. And how did it feel to have fans screaming at you in a ballroom, but the next day you walked down the street, nobody knew who you were? Great. <laughs> Still the same. <laughs> nobody, nobody <laughs> nobody knows has changed. <laughs> nobody knows who I am. Nobody knows who our chief is. Maybe in his own locality, yes. But generally speaking, nobody would know. It's, it's nice. It's a nice... It, to me, it's, it's a, a savour. I mean, there were so many people laughed at us in the business. You know, I, I couldn't get a job for our, the Indians in 1971. We had management there having a hard time. We couldn't get the work because the professionals in the business thought it was going to be an overnight thing. Sure, sure. And, and you know, I, I can safe, safely say that because I know the, the carnivals, the marquees, committees around the country, they're... they're what made the Indians? Frankie, if I can come back to you, I was making the point earlier on that if a band had a hit song, it would ensure packed out ballrooms during the period that that song was in the charts. Original material worked and worked for Joe because Make Me an Island brought Joe across another dimension, across that bridge of original. So everybody was singing Make Me an Island, but nobody, Joe, it was Joe's number, it was his number. Same as you're such a good looking mum and the list goes on and on. So having original material definitely put the band on and put Joe on a huge pedestal. And we were yeah. with them. In, in your case, Frankie, I might come back later on to the fact that you visited Russia and other parts of the world where Joe was very popular. But Eamon, if I can go back to you, mm. um, I've heard what I can best describe as one or two horror stories about the state of various ballrooms around the country. I mean, how good were they and how bad were they? Well, usually our changing rooms were storage, store rooms. You know, they were, they, they stuck up the chairs and the whatever, whatever things they had hanging around that they didn't want the dancers running into would have been in your dressing room. And uh, frankly, verify that for you. Oh, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they wouldn't have any, uh, you mentioned about uh, females in the band, they, they wouldn't have a mirror in the, in the dressing room. No, we, we got to the stage in the 70s when we needed a mirror to put the makeup on. Otherwise, it was, you know, you stick your fingers in the, in the pot and put, put it on your face. But uh, no, there, there were certain things that were left aside that didn't matter to a lot of people running the games. Promoters, some of them didn't pay much attention to that end of things at all, as long as the band turned up and the crowd turned up for the band. But getting back to dressings, I'll just name a few. I mean, it's, it's old days now, but do you remember Dundrum? They never finished the dressing room. I mean, it was a big stone dressing room and there was a kind of a toilet half built. Yeah. And you'd be there at five or six in the evening. This is the old dance hall days. You wouldn't go on to 11. There's a pub across the road, so the crowd wouldn't come in to nearly 12. So it was an all-day and all-night session in that place. And, you know, and another place was a classic ball in Gort. This is that you change it. Stone everywhere. No heat. You know, that's what we were used to. You know what I mean? But the marquees, some of them are pretty good, but the, the stage used to shake. Mm. And I mean... And then behind, everybody could see a change and there was a bit of a barrier up. But you could see your, the top shoulders and stuff. And remember, this is a true story. We played a lot of marquees. But remember one night, the place was packed and Joe was trying to get his trousers to change back. And he was rubbling all over the place. And people were looking in and Joe went over the bed and says, Ben, I am playing no more tents. 
<laughs> and this is what? This is jam. Finished with these tents. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> that was the end of it. Eamon, yeah. can, you, can you recall, dare I say it, <laughs> any difficulties getting paid? When you say difficulties getting paid, we always came home with something, you know. Yeah, no, but I've heard stories about, you know, ballroom owners where the place would be absolutely jammed and then the band would go looking for their money at the end of the night and they'd be told, oh, Jesus, you know, we had a bad night. You'll have to do us a deal here. Well, you always get that anyway. But they, they, it's always they, a bad night, yeah. Some, some of them, some of them, uh, a couple of instances, we, we, you know, one in particular would have been playing a marquee and them selling pass outs at the gate, you know. So that meant it wasn't going through the cash box. So the tickets were being sold at the gate and the people just walked up to the door, showed their ticket and walked in. But we didn't see any part of that money. Happened several times. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what else would have happened? Yeah, where, where they would have been selling from two rolls in the cash box. You have two rolls over their head. They're selling from one. <coughs> from and the other roles to other people. So when it came to money, well, there was some of us missing then. There was a lot of cash changing hands anyway. Yeah, there was going somewhere anyway. Yeah. Uh, I remember one time we were playing at a marquee and it was actually held up at the time. On the night. As, as in robbers? As in, yeah, yeah. Guns. And there was a, a lady in, in the cash desk and she was told to dish out the money, which she did. She got whatever money was there and put, put it up to them and the way they went. But what they didn't check was what she was sitting on. She was actually putting money into a bin underneath the chair. And they never noticed. So they went off without, without the money. Things like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, they're very good. Only, they're only ordinary happenings, aren't they? You no, know, that was yeah. good money. Uh, I remember them passing by, we were changing in the van. And another night, and hitting the side of the van with, with uh, the butt of the rifle, you know, just to let you know that they were there. Pretty scary. Father Brian, I want to come back to you. Um, I've heard stories where, let's just say, the timing of dances and the way people conducted themselves in dance halls would vary from diocese to diocese, uh, depending on, we'll say, the temperament of the local parish priest or indeed the local bishop. Can you talk us through, um, if you like, the religious influence on everything from what time a dance would start at, what time it would, it would finish? And I've heard stories that, you know, men and women had to dance a certain distance apart in case they got too close and things became a little bit, if you like, immoral. Ah, well, so there would be no point in going out if they were, didn't get a little bit immoral sometimes. Um, as that was one of the purposes of going out uh, and dancing, and where it was, sort of, it was you know, it's where matches were made, it's where people met uh, their partners for life. It was the ballroom of Glen uh, of, of Romance in, in Glen Farn, with uh, uh, which was a famous ballroom and gave its name to a lot of others as well. In, initially, you say, as I was saying earlier, initially, the, the all the halls were run in dances were run uh, in parish halls, um, and and uh, uh, so the priest was in charge of some things there, and there was quite a lot of uh, control of it. Uh, in the diocese that I came from in Clogher, um, uh, it was a mortal sin to go to a dance that didn't end at midnight. Uh, whereas up the road, which was about a half a mile across the river, was Kilmo Diocese, and you could go there and dance to one o'clock. Um, and so that was, there was king things that then Lent, there was no dancing in Lent at all. Lent. Uh, 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 for for the whole of Lent, and most people had to go to England. That became. I remember Larry Cunningham telling me that he, he thought that actually worked in reverse because the, by the time Easter came around, people had been starved of dancing, and they were mad to get back dancing again. And Easter Sunday was a colossal night's dancing uh, because of that. And but it, it, we, because there was no break, then it, it became tired of the bands. It also did another thing. The bands went to England and America during Lent, and it actually gave them an opportunity to grow their audience in those areas, particularly in England. And England became a, a very big source of uh, revenue yeah. for show bands and bands. And to this day, is was, uh, that that actually happened because of Lent. 
um, th there were priests who used to go around with a walking stick and putting it down between a couple dancing. That was a regular enough thing uh, between the couple. Uh, and the phrase was to leave room for the Holy Spirit down there when they got there. And there was another, uh, remember the Clipper Carton guys telling me they went to Kerry one night to a dance and there was a priest and he sat beside, uh, beside the band on the stage uh, all night uh, reading his Divine Office Bravery. And after every, after every set of three, especially a fast set, he would tell the band, stop, 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 stop. And he'd take out a watch and he'd wait down and he'd wait two minutes till the people cool down and their passions cool down. And then he'd say, start the next set, start the next set, start the next set. <laughs> <laughs> And Mickey O'Hanlon, God be good to him, was, was sitting beside him on the drums and he, he laughed the whole night at this priest organising things. But, you know, but there was all of that sort of thing. There were, it, you know, Ireland was a, an evolving place and so you have good and you have bad. But you know it was innocent and it was lovely. Father Brian, let me ask you this question and I'll put this to Frankie and to Eamon as well. Um, certainly in the mid to late 60s, you could feel the tension starting to bubble up in the north. How important were show bands, if you like, in terms of bringing both sides together, albeit in a ballroom for one night a week? Well, I think it was very important. And maybe there's even more than one night a week they went to dances. And they did sort of cross borders as well, not just cross, um, you know, the, the cross ghetto borders, but sometimes in the border areas, the, the, the people mixed from Monaghan to Fermanagh, from Monaghan to Cavan, from Cavan to... Um, to and Muff. Uh, yes, exactly, exactly. There was a, there was a, there was a there was a quite a lot, a lot of that mixing, and then the, the, the music was never sectarian in the north, and and even in Belfast, the major halls in Belfast, they 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 all went together to that, and you know Protestants and Catholics uh, in the north to this day uh, accept the show bands as part of their heritage. I agree. But, it, it, that's one of the few things that they do accept as, as uh, each other as uh, having it. And, and I think it was a, a, a big thing. One of the things is very rarely you known. I was slightly involved in this in a little way in, in carrying messages for the ceasefire, uh, the first ceasefire that Albert Reynolds brought about. <clears throat> and um, uh, one of the major, major successes of that was they weren't sure how they were going to get the extreme loyalists to, to come in on this. Uh, he Albert had tried to work with the extreme nationalists and, and was successful there, but it was not coming round in, in the extreme loyalists. Um, and Albert himself knew uh, from the ballrooms that he was promoting, he knew quite a lot, I'm not going to mention any names now, but he knew quite a lot of people in, let's say, Balamina and other areas who had a huge influence on, on what was then the DUP. And uh, Albert went to them and asked them, could they possibly use their good influence to help this piece, that it would bring back, you know, dances and bring back prosperity to them. And they went and spoke to the leaders of the loyalist organization. And it was because of them that they came on board with the ceasefire. And so the bands had paid the contacts made through the bands had been a major, major issue in, in bringing about the ceasefire of the early 90s. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Frankie, what, what's your, what's your <clears throat> memories of playing in the North and how playing in the North, where, where possible, differed from playing in the South? Well, when I started the band, <clears throat> I mean, we were doing a couple of nights a month. Like the Orpheus was a Tuesday night gig, Milano's the weekend, Caproni's. Everybody was so happy. I, I always noticed the North, uh, when we're talking about the North, they had more, they were dressed more modern, the girls and the guys, you know, whatever was happening in, in England or in the States, you know. But apart from that, everything, it was happy, happy. I mean, we did Balamina for Sammy Barr, all those halls we did. We played the North quite a bit, a lot, a lot. And we all loved playing. We played, you know, all those big balls. But as things moved on, I don't want to kind of, go too far on you here, Ken. I remember uh, it was kind of, I think it was just before the Miami tragically, God help them all. And we were playing in, uh, we were playing in this hall, good crowd in it, but I remember uh, after the dance, we didn't play any anthems. It was coming close to kind of what was going to happen. We, we did away with anthems, no matter who we were playing for, mixture of people, we just got out of that. But this girl came up to me and she was obviously a Catholic girl, and there was a few girls with her, and she says, you didn't play the National Anthem. Anthem. <laughs> and I says, what? You didn't play the National? And they were very kind of annoyed. 
I was sitting, we given out photographs, you know yourself, Brian. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. And I was surrounded by, and I just got this, I told Joe afterwards in the boys, I said to myself, I've got to get out of this one. one of them. So I looked over at Pat Hoy and I said, do you see this guy on the base? He is a Presbyterian. And I said, the drummer, Tony, he is no religion. He told me he's an atheist. The Dolans are staunch Catholics. And this other fellow, he's a Protestant. I'm a Catholic. How do you expect us to play any anthem here tonight? Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. And they walked away. I mean, that just came out. Now, I don't know what to say. What do you say when you didn't play? You didn't sure. play the anthem. But uh, then later on, we didn't play the North after the Miami tragedy for about 12 or 14 years, you know. And a lot of the bands pulled out. Gradually went back in. Joe reluctantly went back in. And uh, I remember Tony Newman, God be good to him, the drummer. You'd all remember Tony. And Tony yeah. you remember Brian as well. But we had this date in the North. And we were going to be ushered through the border. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. Tony went up to the office to Seamus Casey and Ben that morning. He says, he says, I'm going to tell you one thing. He spoke with a lovely accent, Tony. He says, I'm going to tell you one thing, Lance. Me or my drums aren't going to the north of Ireland tonight. And we didn't. We were, we wandered back after a couple of years anyway when we played it, you know. But Sure. Eamon, what was your experience of playing in the north? And did you notice a difference between either attitudes or, you know, enthusiasm towards bands from the we south? Never, never came across any animosity at, at any stage. Amazing. And we went in, I think, within two years of the Miami disaster, we went back in and played there ever since. Frankie, and I want to come back to you because we're moving on in terms of time. The Joe Dolan experience was probably different to most Irish show bands in that I think I read somewhere you were the first band from the West to play in Russia. Did I read somewhere you played in Moldova? You were very popular in South Africa. Tell me what you remember about doing shows beyond Ireland. Yeah, it was a whole new thing. Being with Joe, like we met at the airport, brought in and everything would be organised. Cases brought into the hotel. Uh, go back to Russia. We got out to Russia because uh, there was somebody belonged to the Russian ambassador at the show in the stadium. Some uh, dignitary there and heard the band and went back and said, more or less, there was a show. There was a tour arranged that this band would suit a tour, and there was a uh, a kind of a dance troupe, vocal group sent to the UK and Ireland. It was a kind of a cultural exchange. So we went off to Russia, and being the first Western band, what are we going to do here? You know. So we had this usual meeting because nobody did this before, and uh, we all had a bit of a say. And Joe, Joe had a kind of a a good continental kind of a program with. Crazy Woman. They were into the fast stuff, Good Looking Woman, uh, Lady in Blue, all that stuff. Pretty continental stuff. But I decided, lads have a great idea. We should open with Midnight in Moscow. I like. I mean, I met Kenny Ball years years after, you know, I told him. So we rehearsed mid, including his middle age solo, you know, and Bright or uh, Eamon, you'd all remember that. Anyway, we rehearsed it, went to Russia, opened the show with Bam, 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 the whole lot. And then Joe was introduced. And uh, we had people looking after when we dined to see what we wanted to eat. You put up your hand, it was like school, and then somebody looked after Joe. And there was a lady announced the band on with 15 different dialects of the Russian language. It took about 10 minutes to get us on stage. And her last couple of words, this was our clue. You get, a, you get on stage with uh, Orchestra Irlande. And we'd all march on stage. It was a huge place. One stadium was 10,000 yeah, right. people. So uh, that was it. But uh, this little lady, Bella, she was looking after the band. Whatever you wanted to eat, you put up your hand, steak, chicken, whatever. And she says to me one day, do you know, Frankie, she says, that midnight in Moscow. She says, yeah. She says, we have thousands of people singing that in choirs, right? So I suddenly thought to myself, yeah, I know where you're coming from. It's like the Russians coming down and singing when Irish eyes were smiling. <laughs> but having said that, it was very well accepted. We were brought every here. There was a coach outside our hotel in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, brought us to, you know, the, the armories. We were in the palace, the gold room. We saw the paintings, uh, the remnants. It was really, it's not that we didn't appreciate it. We were kind of in awe with everything and moving from one thing to another, going here and there. But it was a fabulous trip. The first night we arrived, we stayed in the Metropolitan Hotel off uh, 
of the square, Lennon's tomb and the whole lot, Red Square. So after we ate, we all marched up to the Red Square, see the tomb, Basel Cathedral, all lit up. So it was an it was an unbelievable experience. Yeah. I have to say, you know, I have to say. That. How popular though was was Joe Dolan and the band, you know, beyond Ireland? I hear stories that he had a huge following in South Africa, for example. We did two, yeah. With the first tour we did, well, it was about a month, and then the second tour we did about maybe six or seven weeks. The last tour was phenomenal. We did nineteen eighty four. We did two shows a night, ten weeks, uh, and they were all one nighters. The first three weeks, we, you know, you'd you'd base yourself in Johannesburg, you'd go down as far as Kimberley and you just time to have maybe get into your room check in have a swim back sound check show at whatever six half six another show at nine o'clock Tough but uh, he had a huge following and uh, I mean he had hits out there that weren't hits here he had the Lady in Blue was very big out there Make Me a Line of course was the big one that brought us out of the, you know and uh, Joe had a very heavy schedule he'd arrive and he'd have to sign and meet people in a record store and, it, and then he'd go into a sound check. I don't know how he did all that stuff, you know. Yeah. Did but, I read uh, somewhere that somebody like Julio Iglesias said that he was influenced by Joe and that there were some other big names in the world of showbiz who were big fans? Yeah, well, I mean, Joe, he met uh, Demise Russo. I mean, it was very funny. Him and Joe were singing the same type of songs. Uh, goodbye, my love, goodbye, and then to Venice and all that. But Mike Murphy... The radio man, you know, Mike, very jovial guy. He'd say, yeah, why is the Miss Russo copying Joe? Because that went down well with all the Joe fans, you know what I mean? But he was popular. Joe was popular all over. And uh, we did different tours in France, Germany, uh, Italy. Uh, we did let, me, let me interrupt you there, Frankie. How did uh, Joe and the band hook up with Albert Hammond? Uh, well, that's, that, was, that was Make Me an Island. That was the little tape at the beginning, and you know he recorded it, and it came from there. And they did Teresa was the second number, and then make me. But then he was lucky in so far as uh, Roberto De Nova came on the scene, the guy that wrote Sister Mary Venice, and it went on and on more and more. It's you, it's you, and that story stemmed from Seamus and uh, Ben were in at a meeting. I think it was Decca, some of the big record companies in England, and. Uh, they were having a chat, and this guy outside seemingly said to the the office girl, "Who is inside?" And you know, she said, "Joe Dolan." And he started dancing. I've been looking for Joe Dolan for many years, so he hugged Joe. Joe had no clue who he was. I have yeah, some yeah. music for you, Joe. <laughs> and this is how that relationship started. You know what I mean? Like Joe's been lucky, yet he deserved all the luck. He's a fabulous singer, and Roberto, the, the tunes he wrote suited. You know, there's a story when he did more and more. Joe was telling. Him, they were recording in the studio and uh, <clears throat> Roberto was behind them shouting into his own more and more at the top of his voice and would you ever <laughs> you know <laughs> it was a great relationship but the, the, the hits kind of came on and on in Venice and so yeah he had great writers and then Adrian Dolan wrote a few, few numbers from as well so right up to the end it was all original stuff, you know. Yeah. Eamon, what was your experience of playing abroad, particularly to Irish communities in places like London, Manchester and so on? You know, what kept us going for the last 20 years would have been the breakthrough that we made with the English clubs, you know, because uh, the Irish clubs are closing down. They've been closing down for the last 20 years. Uh, membership of the club is uh, Irish people emigrating to England. They've gone further afield now all over the world. But... Uh, we, we had a fantastic innings in the 70s, starting off in the Galti and Cricklewood for, for John Bournes and the family. They did a, a series of ballrooms. They went to Birmingham. You know, we had the ballrooms down in, in Manchester. They were the Irish centres. But then when we made a video there in the early 90s, that got across to the clubs because we made it in, in uh, where was it we made it? Pontins, yeah, Pontins down in, in, in uh, I'm trying to think now, Green Sands, Somerset. We made a video and a lot of the clubs attended then. And it just took off from there, you know, took off. The, cl the clubs then wanted to have us in their own venues. So that kept us going for a, a lot of years, you know. Father Brian, I'm going to come to you because we're coming towards the end. You would have written a lot 
about the scene, the bands that were popular at the time. At what stage did you begin to notice that this phenomenal era in Irish life was starting to come to an end? Well, it, it has had fits and starts, uh, Ken. Uh, there, were, there, there were always cycles of, 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 of uh, popularity. And it always was lucky enough to have perhaps one or two fresh bands just to give it a kick. Susan McCann did that when she came on, uh, and that very badly needed it. And it, it did that for a few years. Tony Lockman got me good to him, brought a few bands on, which did that and, and opened it out and new ideas came in and new I learned, went into lounges. And, you know, it kept it kept surviving because it kept compromising with what, what was there. Um, and, and I think <clears throat> Daniel then gave it a huge lift when he came. But the, the, he didn't want to do ballrooms, you see. So it, 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 he had then evolved it not from dancing, but for concerts and cabaret and sit, sit down things, which helped a lot because the people were getting older and were very glad to sit down uh, and, and do it. Nathan brought a whole new group of people into it again. But I think COVID is the thing that might have finally put the nail in the coffin. I have that. I hope I'm wrong, but it, I, I can't see it coming back from COVID because the main people who are supporting the heart of the scene uh, are people who are vulnerable and will find it very hard to come back out and mix in the same way. So uh, I've noticed it changing and changing and being able to just survive, just survive. But it has gone maybe from 650 bands to about 15 bands. Yeah. Now, Frankie, I'm going to sort of leave the last word with you. If a young person asked you to, if you like, sum up the show band era and the, you know, the trendy suits, the uh, the, the footwork, uh, the, 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 the trumpet and the brass sound that went with it, the pack dance halls and so on. If you were asked to sum up the ballroom era, what would you say? Uh, it was an exciting time. Different era, totally different era. And as uh, a... <clears throat> As Eamon pointed out, rightfully so, that it's going to, co- I think it'll come back in a kind of a cabaret situation with the scene. You know what I mean? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. I mean, it's only opening up. Uh, it'll never be the same. But actually, when the show band was in its heyday, it was probably, as Father Brian said, 600. Band. There could have been 10,000 people working in the business, fellas selling vans, you know, fellas, bouncers in halls. <laughs> I mean, they're making suits, you know what I mean? Now, if, if somebody employed 10,000 people today, the government would have them on the late, late show, they'd be shaking hands, they'd be photographs in the paper. I don't think the bands got the recognition from the hierarchy in government for all the work. And there were still, you know, I know it wasn't, the tax thing probably was a bit hit, hit and miss, but <laughs> they were keeping an economy going. Uh, people were, as I said, there was, t- you know, people making suits, Garages fixing vans, garages selling vans, guitars, trumpets, all this stuff has been bought. So, I mean, that was then, this is now, and I think it's going to come back in a different form. Possibly Cabaret with restricted hair, and that'll stay for a while. It's hard right, to Did you want to get a, a final word in there? Yeah, you know, I, 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 my hope is that every generation uh, finds some way of entertaining itself. And I hope that the next generation will find. <laughs> some form of live music. It won't be a show band, but it will be some form of it. We're going to have to leave it there. We, we could explore so many other angles about this extraordinary era in Irish life, particularly in the 1960s and the early 1970s. I want to thank Eamon Keane, formerly of the Indians, Frankie MacDonald, formerly of the Joe Dolan Band, and Father Brian Darcy for their contribution tonight. I do hope you enjoyed the programme. And until the next time, from myself, Ken Murray, bye for now. <laughs>